Um, I am another one of these economists, token or otherwise. And um, what we do, um, I'm the economic sector advisor for the social sectors in the Inter-American Development Bank. And part of what we do is precisely the kind of things you guys are talking about here. We try to, and we do, have conversations with the likes of the ministers of finance of various countries about spending priorities and outcomes and costs and so on and so forth, in addition to doing um, research. And before I get into the, the, the substance of the talk, I want to point out a salient feature about that. We recently, the Inter-American Development Bank has an annual publication, next year's publication, this is the flagship publication, will be on uh, early childhood development. And so we've been doing a lot of the analysis for that already. And you find some staggering facts. For example, in rural Brazil, just to give the, one of the examples, the poverty rate um, amongst children is 40 percentage points higher than the poverty rate amongst adults 65 and older. 40 percentage points. That's the difference in poverty rates. And yet, the spend, and that's, Brazil is the most dramatic example, um, but that's pretty much what you find in virtually all of the Latin American countries. And it is because the kinds of things we've done, we've, you guys have been talking about here, I think we've done a very poor job translating um, the kinds of findings from the science here into actual policy influence. Um, and Latin America in the last two decades has implemented a variety of programs for the elderly, mainly non-contributory pensions, which have really brought down poverty amongst the elderly. Um, and amongst children, very little has changed uh, over the last um, two decades. And if we look at spending patterns, we can actually see that spending per uh, uh, old age adult is on the order of three, four times as much as spending per young child, even if you take into account programs like cash transfers, which are um, have some benefits for children, but it's not clear that all the benefits should be tabulated for children. So there really is an issue about how to translate um, the science of what we're doing here into policy making. And I do think there's a point I made in a, at an earlier meeting of the IOM. I do think it's partly because we are sort of stuck in what I find somewhat arid debates about what is the exact perfect indicator. And as a result, we have no indicators. And as a result, we have nothing much that we can talk about when we go to um, policy makers. And that's really a, a depressing uh, stance. It might be uh, very nice from a scientific point of view, but it's not so good in terms of the lives of these children. So with that introduction, which has taken up uh, probably about a fifth of my time, what I want to present here is um, ongoing work, because the other thing that we do at the IDB is we do um, research, and we fund a great deal of research. Um, and this that I'm going to present here is to some extent to get us to maybe, maybe rethink some of um, the emphasis that we've been having exclusively on very young children. Um, this is work that is largely, what I'm going to present, is largely based on joint work with Caridad Araujo, who's sitting there, Pedro Carneiro and Ianu Cruz. And what it is, it's really an analysis saying, look, by the time these kids get into kindergarten, by the time they're five, six years of age, is it too late or is it not too late? So let me start by saying that as many of you have pointed out, and I'll show you a graph exactly for that point, Many children in Latin America arrive at the threshold of schooling with deep deficits, not just nutritional deficits, which we've been measuring for a long time, but also language and cognitive deficits. This is from a paper with uh, Jerry, Caridad, Raquel, and a variety of other authors, um, which is forthcoming. And this is um, looking at the TVIP, which is the Spanish-speaking version of the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, a receptive language test. We have data that is essentially representative of the population in rural areas. And what we have here for these five countries, we have the fraction of children that is more than two standard deviations below where they should be um, with regard to the reference population that was used to norm the test in each of these countries, and then the differences between the first um, and the first, the poorest, and the fifth, the richest quintile. And what you see that some countries are clearly doing very well. There are essentially no children delayed by this measure in Chile. But many countries are doing very poorly indeed. Um, and even some countries that have actually, Peru is, not, is, is now uh, one of the countries that has some of the highest income in Latin America. Is, uh, it's recently been uh, um, uh, Standard & Poor's upgraded it to the point where it has now the highest rating of any country in Latin America after Chile. Many of these countries are doing very, very badly. And there are steep socioeconomic gradients in terms of how kids do when they get into school. And this has led. Indeed, um, I think, to a variety of interesting, um, innovative, innovative social policy and careful evaluations of a number of programs that are directed at children before they get into school. Some of that is on cash transfers. Virtually every country in Latin America now has either a cash or a conditional cash transfer program. 
There's been um, a lot of evaluation work on what that does to child development. There's this kind of stuff on parenting interventions that Paul uh, presented. There's also uh, complementary work that Horacio Atanasio at UCL and others are doing on a program in Colombia. And then there's work, ongoing work now, what happens, what is the impact, if you like, of center-based care for young children. And all this is excellent work and should be done, and certainly nothing I'm going to say should in any way challenge either the findings or, this, or the importance of this. But I do want to say one thing. By the time children are five years old in just about every Latin American country, not only are many of them delayed, but in most Latin American countries by now, almost all the kids are in school at age five. So what you see here, this is calculations based on uh, all of the household surveys for the region. What you see here is the fraction of children five years of age who are, were enrolled at some point in the late 1990s, the fraction who were en enrolled in the late 2000s, the year varies a little bit from country to country, as well as the comparable fractions for the first and the fifth quintile. And what you see is a great deal of progress, and as a result, a lot of shrinking in the gaps in enrollment between the first and the fifth quintile, and in many countries, close to universal enrollment. So what I'm saying, and I guess in some sense what I'm going to be presenting is, so now we have all these kids. Maybe not all. We have a lot of these kids. They are sitting in classrooms. This is age five. By the time they're age six, you've got essentially 100%. I'm talking age five, kindergarten. These kids are in the classrooms. Is it really too late at this point? What can and cannot be recovered at this point? Have we sort of missed the boat? And what I'm going to argue is that no, we have not missed the boat. That there's a lot that we can do and that the critical element here is teacher quality, or at least the quality of the education that these children are exposed to. So what did we do? We essentially did a study that is similar to a very well-known study in the US uh, called the Tennessee Star Experiment. We took a random sample of 204 schools in Ecuador. These schools. For in all of these schools, kindergarten is the first year, and all of the schools have two or more kindergarten classes. We randomly assigned an entering cohort of about 15,000 children to different teachers in the same school. We have a compliance rate of about 99%. That means a year later, it's not just that we randomly assigned them and then we went home, we actually went throughout the year and made sure that the kids were sitting where they were intended to be sitting, in other words, with the teacher that, we've been assigned, that they had been assigned to, and 99% of the kids are, in fact, sitting where they're supposed to be sitting. This is much higher levels of compliance, by the way, than, for example, the Tennessee uh, Star and some of the other experiments, like the uh, MET study, which is being conducted right now. Then at the end of the year, a year after these children were randomly exposed to teachers of, as I will show you, very different quality, we collected, for 15,000 kids, we collected 12 different tests. Four tests of math, four tests of language, and four tests of executive function. Tests of response inhibition, a test of working memory, cognitive flexibility, and attention. This took about 40 minutes per child. So this is a big effort. 15,000, they're obviously tested individually. This is not a test that you go into the class and they're all sitting there and you say, okay, everybody pay attention. Here's the little test, everybody fill it out. We took 15,000 children and tested them individually. Uh, the vast majority in school, those who had dropped out or were not in school on that day were tested at home. So a big, big effort. About 93% of children, including those who had dropped out, completed all of the tests. So the first thing we find, this part is descriptive, the first thing we find, just consistent with everything else that we've heard here and consistent with the data I showed you before, is that there are in fact, at the end of the year, this has, so far this has nothing to do with teacher quality, there are in fact steep socioeconomic gradients in these development outcomes. So now we've got these children who were five at the beginning of the year, they're essentially almost all of them are six. And what you see is the differences in mean scores by age um, for language scores, math, executive function, and the average across all 12 tests. For mothers who are, if you want, the top line high school graduates relative to elementary school dropouts. And the difference is it varies from test to test, but somewhere on the magnitude of between 0.8 and 1.2 standard deviations. So there is a big, big difference at the end of the year between children who entered school better, in some sense we know they entered school better because we've seen that before, it's very evident, and those um, who entered school in worse conditions. Now what we did in addition to randomly assigning these kids to these classrooms, we collected what we believe is very rich, unusually rich data on teachers. And in fact, what we did is for a full day, we filmed these teachers teaching a class. And for about 80% of those teachers, we also have data on their teaching practices, which I will describe in a little bit, 
for the previous year. Okay, that actually turns out to be quite important. This video, so now you've got, you can think of this, we've got 450 uh, teachers, um, that's the, the sample. So we've got 450 times two, really 900 days of teaching of these um, teachers. Again, in this case, compliance is 100%. We filmed all of the teachers, and we coded it according to a protocol that's been developed by Bob Pianta and his colleagues at the University of Virginia, which is called the Classroom Assessment Scoring System, the class, and which essentially scores a teacher. You cut this video into 20-minute segments, and it scores a teacher on three broad domains. One is emotional support, one is classroom organization, and one is instructional support, and it's very clear what behaviors you're looking for in that 20-minute um, segment. A number of papers with US data I found that children exposed to teachers with better class scores have higher learning outcomes, and then there's also a complementary body of research which uses randomized control trials, including uh, uh, an excellent paper by Hiro Yoshikawa and colleagues, which uses RCTs to show that, in fact, these class scores are not something that is just fixed for the teacher. You can, in principle, actually change it. The class scores can be changed with innovative uh, programs of, uh, of uh, mentoring or in-service training and so on and so forth. We also have data, this has not been analyzed yet, we also have data, we also, this is another, I think, remarkable thing, all 450 teachers, we have the Wexler intelligence test on them, we have the big five personality test on them, we have a variety of executive function measures on all of these teachers, again with compliance of 100%. Immense collaboration, immense insistence too from our side, but immense collaboration from the Ministry of Education in this project which has been going on for a number of years now. So first, let me show you the descriptives and then I'll get quickly into a couple of the main results. These are the class scores. This is this measure that I just told you about, which uh, Pianta and colleagues developed, which is now actually um, used in a number of states um, to measure the quality of Head Start, for example, which a number of states has also used in other measures of uh, classroom quality. And what we have is these are the, the 450 teachers in our sample. We see that on average, the emotional support in the classroom is somewhere on the medium to low. Um, the classroom organization actually looks like it's pretty high in the sense higher scores. One to two is low, three, four, and five is medium, six and seven is high. The instructional support, and we can talk more if people want in the uh, question and answer what you actually measure in, ex in instructional support, is extremely low. All of the teachers, there is not a single teacher in our sample who has a score higher than a two on instructional support. It's generally the case in HEROES data from Chile and generally the case in US data as well that instructional support scores tend to be lower than the scores on the other two dimensions, but this is exceptionally lower if you want to think about it that way. So it would seem that nothing much is happening in these classrooms. So I'm going to show you the results from what we actually did. What we did is essentially two parts to the analysis. The first part has nothing to do with the class. Forget about the class. Forget I ever told you about the class. Think about simply I have randomly assigned, there are 60 kids that come into the school, I have randomly assigned 30 to Paul and 30 to Ramanan here. And then, I've only got like three minutes. And then what I look at the end is just say on average how much more do the kids in one class than the other, without knowing anything about the teachers. How much more do the kids in one class relative to the other one learn? And then what I do, there's a whole literature in the economics in this, you sort of have to correct for measurement error and you have to calculate these teacher effects and so on. But basically what it says is that it makes a great deal of difference whether you were assigned to one or the other teacher in that class. That what you have, and it actually makes a difference, this is like, as, as far as we know, the first such trial that also measured it in terms of executive function. And not only that, what is really interesting, it's the same teachers, these are teacher effects now in the different dimensions and the correlation between them. When you correct for measurement error, the correlation is about 0.8. So if Paul is a better teacher, sorry to pick on you, Ramanan, if Paul is a better teacher than Ramanan, he is a better teacher on all, for all the different tests. It's not as if, well, Paul, you know, he's kind of a soulful guy, and so therefore all this executive function is working really well. But on the other hand, Ramanan is a bit of a hard, you know what I, the missing word there is, and, but I, oh boy, they're learning math, they're learning, no. The kids in one class are learning more in everything than the kids in the other class. Moreover, if we now look at the effect of the class, a one point difference in the class results in 0.6 standard deviations more learning. Okay? So now I'm saying within schools where we randomly assigned these 15,000 kids to 450 different teachers in 204 schools, if by chance your teacher 
had a one standard deviation higher class score, you, she, I was going to say he, but they're all women, if she was engaging in the kinds of behaviors I was talking about before, if they have one more point in that, your children at the end of the year have 0.6 standard deviations higher test scores in all of these dimensions again. At the beginning of the year, and this is the last slide, so at the beginning of the year, the difference in outcomes between mothers, between children of mothers who had completed high school education and children of mothers who were elementary school dropouts was about one standard deviation. At the end of the year, if the kid whose mother was an elementary school dropout got the teacher with a class score that was one point higher, that difference is no longer one standard deviation. It's 0.4 standard deviations after one year. And this is randomized, randomized assignment, as I said, with around 99% um, compliance. And in fact, the class, it's not just that the coefficient is large. Once you, there's, I can talk more about it, I won't have the time, but there's, there are a lot of concerns about measurement error in the class. So you have to really do something about, in the calculations, about purging out this measurement error. But once you purge out the measurement error, the class explains about a third of the cross-teacher within school variation in child learning. There's a lot. Boy, I mean, we're, we're generally happy when we get a, you know, this is one variable. We're generally happy when we get an R squared of like 5% with one variable. I don't want to get into, well, any, okay. 35% of the variation is a lot of the variation explained by this one measure. So we have other results. And better teachers are better for, the other thing is distributionally, we have the distributions. It shifts the entire distribution to the right. This is not working on one side of the distribution or the other. Actually, very interestingly, we also, this is actually quite interesting. Sorry, I'm gonna go over time by two minutes. It's very interesting. We also went, as part of this immense effort, we had a household survey in these 15,000 households with again, compliance rates of about 95%, in which we did a variety of things, including asking about exactly the kinds of behaviors that we were talking about before. We asked parents about how much time they spent reading to their children, singing to their children, playing with their children, what inputs there were, what toys there were, and so on and so forth. We also asked parents about, on a one to five scale, how they rated their teacher. And we find two things. One thing is first that these teachers who are teaching better are not teaching, it's not that children are less likely to drop out or are less likely not to attend or more likely to attend if they get a better teacher. It has no effect, teacher quality has no effect on dropout rates or in attendance. It's all it's what's happening, the same, the kids are equally likely to be in class. Everything is about what's happening in the class. And parents can recognize who are the better teachers, but it's not as if then, this is something that economists spend a lot of time thinking about, it is not as if then what they do is they change their behavior to either reinforce what ha what's happening in the better classroom or to, in some sense, offset it. Rather, they can recognize who's the better teacher, but they don't change their behaviors um, as a result. So by way of conclusion, as I said, I wanted to be a little bit provocative. Um, I do think we should worry a great, great deal about what happens before these kids enter school but at least this research here um, suggests that what happens when these kids enter school is that we actually have all of them in school. Certainly in Ecuador by now we have essentially all of them in school and what does make a great difference is what actually happens when they get into school and particularly what happens in regard to the quality of the teachers that they are assigned to. Thank you.